It's 4 o'clock, tea time in England and therapy time here in the Southland. I am Dan Dr. Aykroyd plays a mental patient who masquerades as a talk show psychiatrist in the comedy The Couch Trip. That's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert. I'm Gene Cisco of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie, The Couch Trip, begins with a notion that's inspired a lot of comedies over the years. What would happen if the inmates took over the asylum? Well, in this case, what happens is a little more complicated than usual. Charles Grodin plays a famous Los Angeles radio psychiatrist who cracks up and wants to go away for a long, long vacation. And then his lawyer tries to hire the most incompetent person he can find as a replacement so his client will still have a job when he comes back. He ends up with Dan Aykroyd, an escaped mental patient, who just happens to pick up the right phone at the right time. Well, Dr. Maitland had to leave suddenly for Europe, and he asked me to find a replacement for him while he was away. Well, what kind of money are we talking about here? Well, let's just say that Dr. Maitland has about the most successful practice in Southern California. I don't like that word about, especially when we're talking about money. Could you volunteer a few numbers? Well, I'd say Dr. Maitland makes in the vicinity of, we'll give or take a few dollars, a million a year. Are you there, doctor? I'm here, Harvey, but I'm coming there. Great. The gag of the movie is that Aykroyd turns into an instant media superstar simply by telling the truth and saying whatever happens to be on his mind. Doctor. Well, Yuri, if you need to talk, just come on down and we'll talk. There's, there's no charge. What's your address? I'm working out of the offices of Dr. George Maitland in Beverly Hills. Come down and see me. We'll talk no charge whatsoever. Okay, Yuri? Thank you. Oh, I've got everybody in my control booth here, signaling me like crazy for a commercial. Walter Matthau plays another so-called nut who turns out to make a lot more sense and some of the people who want to put him away. My pills, my maintenance dose. Won't they got cable? Won't be able to watch regular TV without drugs. Who could do that better than math now? There are a lot of good things in this movie. For example, a performance by Charles Grodin, one of my favorite character actors, playing once again his specialty of a self-important snob who tries to fool the world while he's cracking up inside. I also like Dan Aykroyd's relationship with Walter Matthau, the two people that society says are insane, and there they are teaching each other what's really important in life. But I thought the movie itself was too disorganized to make a great comedy. It was all over the map with too many characters, too many subplots, and a silly climax at the end with Dan Aykroyd turning into a hero. I would have liked it better if they just stayed at the level of goofy eccentricity instead of trying to go for some kind of parable about human nature. Well, that's where the Mantha character comes in, and I thought he would have been one character, frankly, that could have been tossed out. I also am a big fan of Charles Grodin, and I was very sorry to see him leave the action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted him to come back and mix it up with Dan Aykroyd. The two of them working together a lot could have made a very interesting comedy. As a result, I don't like this film at all because I compare Dan Aykroyd on the radio with all the callers and I, with Robin Williams in Good Morning Vietnam, and there's just no comparison. I mean, Williams is so much funnier in a similar situation than Aykroyd, who just has really not very much funny to well, say. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, you could always uh, take a movie and look at some other movie, and but I mean, I'm not sure that Robin Williams would, would have been better as a psychiatrist than Dan Aykroyd. Not with this script. He, not with this the script. The problem really is not whether Aykroyd is better than Williams. The problem is with the script and with the fact that that's they take saying. Grodin and send him off to that's Europe right. and put him in another subplot that isn't involved. So I think that's where the problem is. That's just what I said. Not exactly. 30 seconds what, not exactly what you said. No, no not, that's exactly what I said. Not precisely what you said. That's exactly what I said. Okay, our next film is a dismal romantic comedy called Four Keeps, about a high school girl's decision whether or not to abort a baby she's conceived during one magical role in the grass with her boyfriend. The film is never as serious as its subject, and its comedy derives not from its stars, Molly Ringwald, and her boyfriend, played by Randall Batnikoff, but rather from the boy's working-class family. A sample of the good humor, when Molly Ringwald pops the news in front of his parents and her bitter divorced mother at a Thanksgiving dinner. I'm pregnant. Can you pass the turnips?
Honey, promise me you're not going to have this baby. Right now, the whole world is your oyster. Oh, yeah? What about my son's oysters, huh? He's got this brilliant career ahead of him, designing schools and churches and... Darcy and I are going to Paris next summer. Look, if we could all just decide... But uh, we're trying to decide your future here! Why don't we just keep it? Go up. You had a gerbil last year. You forgot to feed it. It died. Not a bad line. A month later at Christmas, Molly Ringwald tells the same gang what she's going to do with the baby. We've decided to keep the baby. We haven't worked out all the details yet. Work out this detail. Your whole future's going right in the toilet. We were going to do it anyway. It's just that we're starting our future now. Future? What future? We got married young. Yeah, we got married young because we were kids. The parents are funny, but away from the grown-ups and amid their high school peers, Molly Ringwald and her boyfriend are bores. For example, here at the senior prom. Looking pretty foxy, that tax boy. Darcy, hi. I haven't seen you in so long. Oh, my God. You are huge. And that's the way the whole movie breaks down. The kids aren't funny by themselves, but the parents are kind of cute. Molly Ringwald, I think, though, should be beyond playing simple whining parts like this one. You know, it's difficult not to make us care about a fetus, but for keeps, didn't even accomplish that. I never took the film seriously, and again, the only comedy came from the boys' parents, who are very funny. It's otherwise a dull movie. I don't know what you think this movie is. You introduce it as a comedy, which I don't believe it's supposed to be. Then you complain you didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether you thought no, no. it was supposed to be a human well, comedy or obviously, not. Obviously, it's supposed to be a comedy when a guy's throwing off gag lines like that. And I think that works. As for the romance and the tension between the two kids, and are they uh, going to keep the baby in their love story, that no, was a complete I think this washout. Movie, this movie is really what it's trying to do, is it's trying to sh hold up a mirror to human nature. The father has lines like that, which help to mask what we find out later is a great deal of tenderness inside, and he's kind of tough on the outside. I enjoyed this movie a lot more than you did. I do believe that real teenagers would have a lot more trouble getting married and having a kid than these two would, but nevertheless, I thought the relationship between that young couple was well written, and I thought the ways that their family families were different in their approach to this baby, to this instant grandchild, was very perceptive. Well, I mean, for, I don't know how you can say that you, you think that real teenagers would have been more complex, it's only, but this script was okay. Because it's only a movie. And it's only an average movie. And it's hardly, I mean... Oh, Roger, if it was a good movie... You, you right now, I'm going to pay you a compliment. Okay, fine. You right now could mm -hmm. sit down and write characters and dialogue with those kids... Better you than right now film. can sit down and write a better review of this movie than you just gave. No, because you I just weren't really it. thinking about it. Gene, oh, there's yeah. a lot more in no. it than you give it credit no. for. No, it doesn't. Okay. When we come back at Discovery, we think it's a Discovery anyway, a movie called Dear America. It's an extraordinary new film based on letters home that were written by G.I.s in Vietnam. Dear Red, anyone over here who walks more than 50 feet through elephant grass should automatically get a purple heart. On the country or everywhere around the country, but our next movie is a film that you cannot see anywhere in the United States right now, and I think that's a shame. I think this is such a special movie, so original and so powerful, that it deserves to find a distributor for theatrical release. And I think a lot of people would be very moved if they could see this film. It's called Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam, and it consists of letters from Vietnam that were written during the war. The letters are read on the soundtrack by many different actors, including Robert De Niro, Martin Sheen, Robin Williams, Kathleen Turner, Ellen Burstyn, and the three stars of Platoon, Charlie Sheen, Tom Berenger, and Willem Dafoe. Their words are illustrated by NBC newsreel footage of the war, and sometimes the words in the pictures match up. Here's a scene from early in the film of draftees just arriving in the war zone. Hi, Mom. Well, I'm fine today, and I hope that you're in good shape also. Today, I am swimming washing and taking in the sun. The beach is great. The Everything is seems like kind of a lark there, but a little later in the film, here's a letter from a GI who only hopes he'll live long enough to see his family again. Well, you learn every day the mistakes you were making and the biggest one is to get too attached to any one person. Not over here, at least. Things happen so quickly in one minute he's fine and the next he's not. But old Don is pretty lucky knock on wood. A home I'll come, I'm sure. Maybe after we wipe them up here, they'll go to the bargaining tables and we can come home. All of us. Love done. Once I was a soldier, 
once again is called Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam. I saw it last December at the Hawaii International Film Festival, and I was astonished to learn that no distributor has picked up this film for theatrical release, although it may play on cable in a few months. At a time when great fiction movies like Platoon and Good Morning Vietnam have found large audiences, here is a documentary told in the actual words of the Vietnam soldiers themselves and in footage that in some cases was too strong to be shown on network TV at the time. This is a powerful film and a powerful emotional experience, and I hope that you all get an opportunity to see it in a theater the way movies are really supposed uh, And to be I seen. agree with you. I think seeing this film in a theater would be an extraordinary experience. It's a superb film, and I think that there's a built-in audience. I almost want to talk directly to the theater owners mm -hmm. of America mm -hmm. and say, you have, regrettably, a very large audience that is interested in Vietnam. You have all the people all the families of the people who were wounded or killed in action. You have all the people whose lives were affected by the war. That's why these, in part, why these films about Vietnam hold such a fascination for us. So many of us were affected by the war one way or another. So there is an audience dying for an interesting film about Vietnam. And this film delivers on that. It is terribly touching. It has all of the elements of all the great films about Vietnam, the footage, by the way, some very fine reporting, I must say, yes. from the, in retrospect, the correspondents represented here mm -hmm. did themselves well. They will be very pleased when they see that. That's right. The, the actual letters from this movie came out of a book uh, with, a, with a similar title. Right. And uh, these are kids, who 18, 19 years old, sitting there in the jungle, probably hungry, tired, wet, lonely, writing these letters, and every word rings true. The other thing is a finish with uh, the monument in Washington, D.C. Yes. And I'll tell you, uh, we have a lot of monuments in this country. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. And it is used very effectively in this movie as a letter is read, a hand is pressed, and we see a name and a face. And it stands for all of the people that served. So I hope that you get a chance to see that movie. Coming up next... Why don't next, you say that title one more time? Letters... Dear, Dear America... Dear America's Letters Home from Vietnam. Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam. Coming up next, Burt Reynolds is a cop in trouble, and Liza Minnelli is a call girl who needs his help in Rent-A-Cop. Well, I certainly hope you're taking care of Della. She's very special to me. We have our moments. Uh, but a better title would be Rent-A-Screenwriter. That's because <laughs> Rent-A-Cop is a very tired, utterly predictable story of a Chicago detective Burt Reynolds, whose buddies are killed during a drug bust by a gun-blazing armed warrior. Somebody Arnold Schwarzenegger would like to fight, I assume. Reynolds' boss suspects that Reynolds might be involved in the crime. That is highly illogical in this story. But an even worse character is Liza Minnelli, a dopey call girl who just happens to be working the same hotel floor where the drug shootout takes place. Both characters are now in danger as witnesses to the crime, and soon Minnelli is making herself at home in Burt Reynolds' apartment. I love this movie. Listen, do you have it in color? You can get it in color now, you know. You know, there's this new process they have. It's fabulous. Can't wait to see Casablanca. Now, why does she have to play you someone stupid? Liza Minnelli is a bright actress. She should do better than that. As for Reynolds, he's busy buying time trying to solve the crime. To do so, he has to deal with his old partner, Bernie Casey, and the young cop, the kid cop, Robbie Benson, who's been assigned to tail him. Tell me you're here taking out one of my neighbors and not me. It's you, Churchy. Right. The whole look of this film is phony, too, as is the threat that Burt Reynolds received from another former cop, now working for the film's bad guy, the rich mobster who has asked this former cop to bump off Burt Reynolds. Why don't we stop screwing around, huh? You work for Alexander. The force was the only thing I knew, and the bastards kicked me off for the same thing half the other guys are still doing. I was drowning out there. Alexander threw me a lifeline. On the phone, you said a matter of life and death. Who's yours? Yours. That's Richard Mazur as the ex-cop, and what a surprise it is, Roger. Weren't you totally surprised when he doesn't kill his buddy? That's because the movie has to go on for at least another 25 minutes with a final shootout and an equally predictable resolution to the reynolds Minnelli romance. Roger and I just did a show called Big Stars and Bad Movies in 1987. Let's mark down rent -a -cop for the same show in 1988. This well, was really bad. I agree with you that this movie is absolutely off the formula line when it comes to the story. In fact, as somebody who sees every movie that comes out, maybe I'm overexposed, but maybe not, because every cliche in Everyone. this movie, every plot development, every character, the descriptions of the characters, what the characters do, how they relate to each other, is absolutely Computer. right off the shelf. 
Yeah. Now, what no, I did no like, surprises. what I did like, I liked the relationship like between the... Burt Reynolds and Liza Minnelli. I thought it was an interesting relationship. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the best work I'd seen them do in quite a while. That's well, not saying much. Well, in the case of Burt Reynolds, he's come off a string of bad movies. Okay. I enjoyed their relationship in this movie. I would have liked to have seen the same relationship in a better plot. Well, let me tell you, there is one moment, there is one scene where Liza Minnelli says something nice to him mm -hmm. about her life and mm -hmm. how she's had a mm -hmm. tough time. And it's a close-up of Liza Minnelli. Mm -hmm. She looks good. She has something honest to say. Mm -hmm. That lasts about 10 seconds. 10 seconds of reality in a film full of... I, well, I'm, of not sure that, I'm not sure I wanted reality in this film. It's not supposed to be a realistic No, no, film. I mean real emotion. Well, I and felt, that's the only thing that okay, I'll grant you. Right, well, but otherwise, this well, is really I worthless. Well, I grant me a little more than 10 seconds. I'd like a little more than 10 seconds granted. But in any event, I agree with you that the screenplay could have been... Written by a thousand well, monkeys, well, that, a thousand dumb monkeys. They wouldn't have taken a thousand monkeys, and they wouldn't have had to be that smart, though. You're right. When we come back, Maggie Smith stars as a lonely Dublin spinster who thinks that love may have come at last into her empty life. The movie is called and The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn. Mr. Madden, Miss Hart. Glad to know you, Miss Hearn. Pleased, I'm sure. Her Academy Award for the Prime of Miss Jean Brody, and now in a new film called The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn, here she is back again with another portrait of a proud and lonely woman, although this one has less spirit and less hope than Jean Brody did. Judith Hearn is an aging spinster who lives in a cheap Dublin boarding house and gives piano lessons and has a drinking problem. One morning at breakfast, she meets the landlady's brother who has just returned from New York City. Lived there for 30 years. Came back here uh, two months ago. Oh, to stay? That's Bob Hoskins as the New Yorker. A few days later, they go to church together, and then, to her amazement and delight, he asks her out. You doing anything tomorrow afternoon? No. I don't believe I am. Okay, we'll, we'll take it a show then, shall we? And maybe a bite to eat after? Lovely. Well, okay. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I love the way he turns and waves there at the end of that scene and seems to be so happy. But in fact, what he's really interested in is opening up an American-style fast food restaurant in Dublin, and he thinks she has some money to invest. When Judith Hearn discovers this, she's very hurt, and here is her great moment in the movie when she tells this man how she really feels. It's always a Mr. Wright, they say. Changing as the years, the years go by. Well, you know, he's tall, dark, and handsome in the beginning, and then... Well, you're, you're not so young, and he's middle-aged, and funny-looking, and common as dirt, and... <laughs> Grant anybody, and anybody so much as gives you a kind word. And that's your prince. Sent to keep you from being alone, and the love, don't talk, that's forgotten. You're just supposed to take him even though you know. You know he doesn't want you. All he wants is an American quick lunch. And that speech goes on and it builds and it comes from the heart and it's a great moment of movie acting. The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn is more subtle than it seems. It's not only a portrait of this woman's deep and abiding loneliness and her desperation to find her knight in shining armor, but I think it's also about the way the Bob Hoskins character may really like her, but he just can't admit that fact to himself. He has to keep coming up with his plans for that fast food joint until at the end of the movie, he totally betrays himself and her. There's some wonderful acting in this movie, some very precisely written dialogue that lets you know what these people feel even when they can't quite bring themselves to say it. And for Maggie Smith, there's a character as unforgettable as Gene Brody. Oh, I think quite true. Um, it's a remarkable performance. You know, you would think, well, it's easy to play another old, uh, older woman who's all alone, and, you know, of course your heart's gonna go out to her, and this is sort of a walkthrough. And I suppose Maggie Smith, of anyone, could walk through it and do it quite well. There's some very subtle things in there. She's a lot stronger than we think, mm -hmm. and she's a lot weaker than we think. I was tricked a little bit by this movie. At one point, I know she's very fragile, but then I'm very surprised at how aggressive she is mm -hmm. in pursuing this guy. Normally, the way to play it would be that she would hold back and wait for him. Mm -hmm. But no, it's written well and played well. The woman has tremendous strengths and great gaping flaws in her personality, which makes her so interesting. And she is also not just a completely likable, lovable heroine. No. There are a lot of things in her character that help explain why she hasn't ever gotten a man before. And the kids and laugh at her, and the other yes. kids laugh at her. You know, I mean, she has some quirky not only, not only do the kids laugh at her, but even the people she thinks are her best friends yes. kind of laugh at her because she's become 
such a kind of an albatross around their necks right. over the years. It's a very complicated film. And, and again, a superb performance. Now let's recap our reactions to the movies we reviewed on the show. Two downturn thumbs for The Couch Trip with Dan Aykroyd and Charles Grodin. A split on the teenage romance for Keep, starring Molly Ringwald. I thought it was phony throughout. Roger liked the young relationship. One thumb up, one down. We were back in agreement on the very powerful documentary, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam. Here's hoping it gets booked into some movie theaters. And two downturn thumbs for the brainless cop romance, Rent-A-Cop, starring Liza Minnelli and Burt Reynolds. And finally, a very strong recommendation for Maggie Smith's extraordinary portrayal of the lonely passion of Judith Hearn. And that's the one film, of course, that I recommend along with, if people can find it, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam. I think that that one may be able to pick up a distributor, and uh, if it I does, so. I think people will see a really powerful... I'd see it a second time. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with a special show that we're calling New Faces in the Movies. Gene and I select eight actors and actresses from recent films whose work has called attention to their exciting talent, people that we found during the year that we thought were really great. So, New Faces next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Nestle Crunch. It's creamy milk chocolate and crispy crunchies. Chocolate is scrunchious when it crunches. That's why you'll love Nestle Crunch. Dry skin can be sensitive skin, so now there's new fragrance-free Curel. Most women agree, Curel ends dry skin. Uncle Ben's Boil and Bag Rice. It's in the bag. No measuring, no mess. Family and single-size servings in 10 minutes. Sticklets is the naturally flavored gum that gives you more sticks per pack than any other gum. Natural flavor, more sticks, Sticklets. 